We're going to be talking about uh, the relationship between conflict management and emotional intelligence. And um, this is a study that uh, is more so of a literature review, just looking at um, how the, kind of the relationship between uh, emotional intelligence uh, and resolving conflicts in the workplace, um, since there's somewhat of a lack of research, uh, you know, looking looking at both of those things. Um, this this literature review is just kind of pouring out, you know, whatever research that they have on, on these two topics. And so, a total of 29 studies uh, of emotion, uh, on emotional intelligence were reviewed, uh, and the authors noted uh, the findings of each of these studies. They recorded uh, the methods uh, which the correlation between emotional intelligence and other variables were tested with. And then the majority of studies were collected from all, all these high ranking business and management journals. Um, and additional suitability criteria were that they had to be peer reviewed English journals. They must be in business management or industry related. Um, and it must have been published after 1990. Um, and so I believe they sifted through something like 900 studies and came down to a solid 29 studies that were uh, concrete enough to use. And um, the, the results of this were that um, it suggested that the role of geography and culture influence conflict management and, and the level of emotional intelligence in organizations. Um, and an example of this is that, you know, employees in maybe more collectivist cultures um, often respond differently to conflict and, and the emotions therein um, compared to employees uh, in individualist cultures. Uh, and then another key finding I uh, mentioned was that um, in general, higher levels of emotional intelligence can, can overall benefit um, organizational performance. Um, and that additionally, uh, emotional intelligence is a key element in resolving workplace conflict. Um, it was positively associated with problem solving strategies and employees, which, is, which often are used in conflict management. Um, research also pointed to the benefits of emotional intelligence in lessening the negative effects of conflict uh, one study noting that leaders who use emotional intelligence were able to decrease the negative effects of relationship conflict on team performance and team morale. Um, and additionally, and obviously based on kind of some of these findings is that emotional intelligence and conflict management uh, are positively associated with one another. Um, and uh, there are several studies I mentioned that um, where emotional intelligence were, was positively and significantly related to certain conflict management styles, um, including integrating, compromising, dominating, um, and it was a predictor of uh, employee innovation as well. And so from this, we can take uh, on kind of the key takeaway that greater emotional intelligence within employees can lead to more constructive conflict management. Um, and the authors here also per pointed out the necessity for both updated inventory, uh, if that's a possibility, um, of employees' emotional intelligence to know where they're at um, and emotional intelligence training programs to help develop the skill. So um, you can reduce or prevent workplace conflict and have more healthy conflict, uh, constructive conflict management and conflict competence. And that's, uh, that's kind of the roundabout of, of this one. But it's good, it's good to see that there's actually some, you know, literature that, that connects the two. It makes a lot of sense. I, I'm curious because I, I haven't, I mean, I know generally emotional intelligence, the way that it's used. I mean, I kind of know generally what it means, you know, being able to identify your own feelings and the feelings of others and then be able to like sort of judiciously determine what sort of approach to have based on what's going on emotionally in that moment with yourself and others. I mean, it's like sort of a generic view, but I, I wonder if, do either of you, have either of you kind of read in depth about this subject or know a little bit more about it? I have not. I have, I read a while back, I read Daniel Goldman's Emotional Intelligence, which he's kind of the, he kind of popularized it. Um, mm -hmm. I can try to find the study because they mentioned Goldman in the, in the study as kind of a, who they're basing it somewhat around. Um, yeah. I think. Well, but I mean, that's, that's the general idea, right? Is like it's it, emotional intelligence kind of encompasses the broad, the broad concept that of like methods or techniques or whatever to, to better understand my own emotional state, to better understand others' emotional state and to be right. able to kind of almost like a, at, at a cognitive level, think through how is the best approach to take in this particular uh, situation or how, how to how to handle manage my own emotions how to help manage someone else's emotions is that kind of what it is and, th and then just like 
different schools of thought about what techniques are the most you know effective or whatever and different does that sound right yeah that's i mean that's essentially kind of the basis of it um that you know you it's, it's there's a level of self-awareness uh, attached to it you know where you you recognize what emotions are going on within yourself and your ability to um connect with others empathize um with the emotions mm -hmm. of others um and let me see i, I have a if you can a second i can post it in ali Morning. cool background <laughs> i like your background thanks <laughs> um so yeah goldman uh kind of defines it as a capacity for recognizing our own feelings and those of others, for motivating ourselves and for managing emotions well in ourselves and in our relationships. So it's a, you know, personal and other yeah. kind of, kind of a thing. Um, it's kind of yeah, easier I mean, said than done, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great concept and I think it's important. It's easier. It's like, I'm, I'm interested because I haven't done any uh, like formal EQ training to know like, what are the methods people use to help learn those competencies, to help understand my emotions, identify them, manage them. And because I, I mean, I have my own that I've used, but I don't know that those are exactly what people in the EQ world use. Be interesting right. to know. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Well, May, I think it's interesting. I mean, um, I feel like emotional intelligence became more popular um, as a I think it, it started becoming more popular when IQ was this big thing, like when you could take IQ mm -hmm. tests and get your number and, and all of that. And um, then this guy, Daniel Goldman come out with, came out with um, like EQ as, as a different measure. And they even mentioned yeah. in the study at one point, just saying how um, for, for great performance in every field, uh, emotional intelligence is, emotional intelligence is twice as important than cognitive ability. Um, and so uh, yeah, I mean, especially if you believe in the in the idea that bi bi business success is reliant upon is about relationships, like more so than product development or something like that, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, which I think is what I, I think is true. Wait, we we you, you keep you can keep recording, but we stop sharing for a moment because I want to I want to bring yeah. up an idea that is related to this. And I want to, I just want to get your thoughts on this. I just, I just had this thought like this morning and I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. I was thinking about like, uh, uh, like talking about how to have compassion for people with different ideas. And this is where the reason compassion is like sort of the main thing is that this is why I'm bringing it up in this EQ discussion, but um, like, Because when I'm I'm talking to someone who's got like a particular like say like political view and they go I can't you know I they they have a lot of anger or rage or whatever and they can't get to a place of compassion they can't get to a place of understanding with people on another side or whatever because they're so caught up in their whatever's going on in the conflict um, that they they can't get there and I was just thinking like how how to help like how to how to like figure out like how to articulate what what can help people move past that, move into compassion away from a sort of destructive conflict. And I was thinking, and I first thought, thought this idea like, okay, first of all, start with a basis idea that we are essentially all of us are living in some sort of illusion, right? Like individually, brain scientists will verify, we are all living in an illusion of some sort. The, the, and, then, and then we like hook up with, we have shared pieces of, pieces of that illusion are shared with other people in our families and social groups, et cetera. But we each have our own unique total illusion that we're, we're, that we're living in. And, and I was thinking like, if you, if you ran into a person on the street who was suffering from mental illness and like talking to invisible people and you could see they were in a lot of anger and strife and stuff like that, most likely you could feel compassion for that person. You could say, man, that poor, per, that poor guy is living in this illusion where he believes things and it's creating so much turmoil and conflict in him and you could have compassion. And I was saying, well, what's the thing that would keep me from having compassion? What's the first thing I do when I notice someone on the street who's, who's erratic or having unpredictable behavior and he's talking to people and stuff like that? I make sure that I'm probably distanced from myself first so that I mitigate any feeling of threat from him. And then it opens up a space for compassion. And I thought maybe that's the way, like if we're all living in an illusion essentially, how do I have compassion for other people's illusions when, and even for my own illusions, when those part of those illusions cause a lot of pain and hurt and, 
and fear and all that stuff. The reason that I can't feel it is because is only maybe be, for me is like because of threat. And if I learn to mitigate the threat, to mitigate the, at least the perception of threat, I can open up a space for more compassion. Because I'm thinking like, if I look at someone like on another side of the political spectrum who I just go, I just, I, I just can't feel compassion for them. But if I start mitigating the threat, I can look at them and go, man, they're, they're really hurting. That's the reason that those view, their views are so important to them because they're hurting, they're afraid, et cetera. Can I come from that space and when I interact with them to a place of compassion and then also compassion for myself? So I thought, I thought okay, so now conflict is on this spectrum of like the compassion to, uh, to threat spectrum. And, it, and it's like, if the threat is high, compassion's low, right? If, the, if compassion's high, the threat has to be low. And so I thought there's one piece of it, but then there's one other piece of it. What's what the other piece that I think uh, keeps us from compassion, it's threat. And then it's also, I think, resentment, like past hurt. So, and so those two spectrums, resentment and, and, and threat, those two things need to be low for me to be in a place of compassion with someone. And then I can like sort of move through conflict more effectively if I come from compassion, but I have to mitigate the threat and I have to somehow reconcile the resentment. That's, that was like my, that was my idea this morning. I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on that. It's like, are there pieces that are not just about resentment and threat, but there's other pieces in there would stop us from feeling compassionate? Um, open question. <laughs> I really like this idea though, Jeremy. And I, I think I read a, an article a while ago about doing like compassion training, which is hopefully to help bridge those gaps. I don't know the ins and outs of it though, but I, I love the idea of trying to do that. Um, I was just reading yesterday about, um, for the Peace Newsletter, Noah, about the Kigali Genocide Memorial and how in 25 years, like they went from a genocide to actually being like a relatively peaceful, country like their economy has improved and everything i'd be curious like you know how do you how do you go from that like you literally have people in the streets murdering each other to yeah. you know years later you're living relatively for the most part in peace so there's ways to do it right to get past those threats and those hurts i i think it's really fascinating though and i think you know on the lower level i think a lot of us do experience that and and how do you see other people's i, I think like humanity and get past those things so I'd love it. I'd love to see something like that. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would expect that if you're moving from a place of like violent conflict into a place of a peaceful society, you, you need to, you need to a figure out how to mitigate threat going forward and b how to, how to reconcile any resentment past hurt past you know, uh, wrongdoings and stuff like that. Those like those two things I feel like probably are, as far as what I know is like super important to, to move to move into a place of peace. And that's, if we don't address them, there's no peace, you know. Right. So that's the big part that I kept thinking about with what you're saying is even if there is past hurt or the feeling of threat, at some point, either or both party has to be willing to acknowledge some responsibility. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if they don't then it makes it really, really hard to even move towards compassion. You know, I mean, you could go through the exercise, but if you're still feeling like they haven't acknowledged what they or how they harmed me, yeah. even expressed it. And even though we're talking and, and listening to one another, they haven't expressed it. They still haven't said, I'm sorry. Yep. It's like somewhere on that spectrum, on the movement from, you know, going from past and future hurts to a place of peace, responsibility is a key component. It is. If, if, you, if you want, you know, future relationships, I mean, and if it's not, like if you can go your separate ways and then just say, well, we'll have a conversation. Um, this is where I stand and this is how I feel. And okay, this is how you feel or whatever. Fine, but then we can go on and not have to interact, then I don't think you necessarily need apology or acknowledgement. Right. Yeah, if like you could, if you could sort of, I guess, 
if you if you want the relationship to heal if you don't care about the relationship and there's a way for you to just avoid each other for the rest of eternity you know fine but 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 it but like depending if like if you're in a workplace you can't really avoid each other if you're in a society if you're in a world and you have two societies like we can't avoid each other like we have to we're interdependent Right. I think the key on finding how to get people to see an outside perspective or get to that place of willingness is the toughest part. Like once you have people who are willing to reconcile or willing to show compassion, you know, you, it, it's so much easier, but it's, it's the most difficult piece of how to get someone who's been really hurt or um, has a big wall. How do you get them to be willing to take that down? Yeah, I think responsibility is a key part of it. You know, because when people don't take responsibility, it's just like, well, they don't even know, then they're not even willing to own up to what they did. So there's no telling that they're not going to do it again, you know? Right. Because they, they feel justified. I did it right. because, or I had right. to do it because you did this, or you were going to try to do this. And so I, you know, I had to do what's best for me. I had to protect mine. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think um, I, I, it's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about this viewed through the lens of threat and um, resentment, but I, that would su it suggests like an interesting an interesting um, pathway for resolution and recognizing the other person um, in terms of you know how to mitigate that threat, and that could be through like you. I mean, you mentioned like the physical side of it. Like if you see somebody that you feel like is you know, seems like a threat to you, obviously in a physically distance. And so I feel like the same could be said about the emotions side of things, like through techniques like self-regulation, where you're kind of identifying the emotion of yourself and identifying the emotion of the other without judging it and rather trying to analyze um, maybe what's the underlying, what's the, what's the underlying value that's being threatened here on, for, the, for this person and, and for me, and then being able to respond instead of react. Um, but then on the resentment side of things that suggests like a need for um, kind of what Tony mentioned and uh, that it's, uh, you know, an apology and forgiveness kind of side of things. Um, and you don't necessarily need, well, I, I, I do think an apology would definitely, I think, be the most effective. Um, but, you know, I think it's even possible um, for parties that have been offended by another um, to to forgive if they're willing to get into that mindset um, without having an apology from the other side. Um, it makes me think of um, like restorative justice practices um, where you have like circle processes where everybody's being acknowledged to some degree and uh, everybody's acknowledging their harm and the harm that they have potentially caused. You have like um, more traditionally like victim offender in the community where um, you know you look at, all right, this is the, this is the offense that the offender has caused. Um, this is the offense that the, the victim has felt. And then here's how the community and the society has maybe contribute to the, both the offenders and the, and the victim's current circumstance, but also what, what do we need from this situation as well? Um, and it, it's just kind of, it's, it's a whole, like it's a circle process where you look at, you look at everything um, related to what transpired from this. Yeah, well, and a difficult part too is when, especially thinking about I mean, I guess any kind of con interpersonal and intergroup conflict, it's like owning, owning up to behavior where you're basically, you can take responsibility. Like I, I understand that we caused harm in some way or something that's tough for people to wrap their minds around. Like they don't want to be responsible for the harm. Like, so, so I want, and I wonder if the, you know, we talk about a lot um, separating behavior from in interpretation or intention. And I wonder if like, if people were willing to own up to their behavior, not own up or take responsibility for the harm that it might've caused, because if they, did, if they didn't intend for the harm, I mean, obviously people actually intend harm, but if they, they did behavior, it actually, it ended up causing some people harm. They didn't intend for that. It's very hard for them to own up to the harm part of it. But if they could own up to at least the behavior, and then they can take some time to like reinterpret. This is what my intentions were. It wasn't to harm you. It was for this reason. That maybe that opens it up too. Is like okay, at least they're owning the behavior. I they didn't mean to harm, but they're owning the behavior and they're telling me why they did that behavior. Now I can sort of like start to understand their intentions here. So I I like how do we how do you get people to own up to some piece of it 
because the, usually people will not own up to the harm unless unless they actually intended to harm. You know, that actually brings back a very very specific conflict. Like I had personally with someone, um, very very close family friend of ours, and we could not, despite coming out with it with like a very like clear attitude, like I'm not angry, I'm not. But I, I just want to sit down with you so you can understand how this had impacted me. And mm. they could not wrap their minds around the fact that those actions could cause harm. And we went like yeah. round and round and round. And I tried to be very like, very like at the low level, like not emotionally charged, but they just still could not get that piece. I, I think that's, that's a great point. Like that's really hard to get someone to own up to yeah. because I, I think it's in some ways maybe painful for them too. Like they don't want to admit that uh, absolutely. they hurt you. Right. right. <laughs> so well, well they don't want because they have some they have some coherent sense of an identity. And that I and that and and owning up to the fact that I harmed someone is not in line with that sense of identity. So you're you're asking me to basically like de-identify with like my normal self and say I'm a harmful person. Like that's very hard. That I think that's what really separates restorative justice practices from conflict resolution practices. Restorative justice is like, it requires a priori, it requires someone to, to acknowledge that they've done harm. Like in conflict resolution, that is not what it requires because people will not own up to having done harm. They'll just own up to their behavior. Say, I did that, but I didn't, I didn't know it was gonna harm you. I didn't try to harm you. And so I think that, that piece, like when you're asking someone to wrap their minds around the fact that, hey, I, I want you, I want to acknowledge that this impacted me this way. They might listen to it, but they won't own up to having harmed you because it's just too hard for them to do. So, I mean, so I, so I wondered, Natalie, like, so for instance, in that kind of thing, can you, would it be, would it be helpful for you if that person said, I do, I did do that. You're right. I did it, but I did it for this reason. It wasn't to do, it wasn't to harm you. I didn't realize it was going to harm you. I understand it did. That's not my intention. My intention was this over here. If you if you could hear them own up to behavior and then like sort of tell you what the real intention was or whatever, could that be enough? Or do you need them to acknowledge the harm? Yeah, I think for me, in that specific scenario, it was really recognizing the harm because it was also a pattern though. It was a pattern of that. Oh, okay. And so so for me, it was really big that they acknowledged it because I was also trying to say like you you really need to stop to, it might be unintentional, but you keep doing it <laughs> over and over. Um, but I think in general, I, you know, I don't know. I, that's a good question. I think in some scenarios, seeing that perspective might be enough. And like I said, because of the pattern, like in that specific one, I think it'd be hard for me to justify it otherwise without, without them recognizing that, yes, I, I did this. I didn't mean to, but I did cause harm. Um, it yeah, so acknowledging that it caused harm may be different than owning up to the intentionality of harm, mm. right? Yeah. Like, I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. And can you acknowledge that I didn't mean to do it? Sure, you didn't mean to do it, but it happened and it caused harm. And then and they could say, okay, I acknowledge it. It caused you harm. That sucks. I, that's not what I wanted, but I didn't mean to. So it's like both of you acknowledging, I didn't mean to, but it did cause harm. And both of you can acknowledge that. Maybe that's helpful. I think so. Yes, I, I okay. think. So. And I think you're right. That means the identity part for that person. Like they feel it makes them feel safe too. You know that that you're aware yeah. that, that wasn't their intention. I think that's a good point. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And like in, in my experience, I feel like that would have been enough if we could have just gotten to that. <laughs> that yeah. Point. So 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 you're so you're looking a to heal the past, i.e. that resentment, right, of the harm it caused and you're also looking to kind of get reassurance for the future that you're not gonna do it keep doing it right and yeah. if you can get through those two pieces you can get to a place of like peace again with this person yeah yeah absolutely yeah. it sounds like the difference between first degree and second degree someone's still dead yeah intentionality versus it just happened i wasn't yeah. premeditated you know yeah I you know, and yeah, I hit him and he hit his head on the concrete and died, but I didn't mean to kill him. We were just in a fight versus I left my house with the intention of killing him. Yeah. But the thing is, there's still someone harmed. Yeah. 
And so, I mean, you know, someone so, so, okay, someone's still responsible. So it's like it's a it's like the difference between acknowledging the harm and owning the harm. I acknowledge it harmed you, but I'm not going to take responsibility because I didn't intend to harm you or something like that, right? Is that what it like there's some some there's something in there about that that's easier for people to acknowledge this caused harm than it is for them to own up to the fact that I actually did something that harmed you or something. You know what I mean? I do. I do. I understand that. But that's the thing where the person who was harmed has got to make a choice to be in a place where you can take that and move on with it. Yes. Rather than stay in that space and continue to feel that angst. So that, that's a choice thing because, you know, I just, I just think it's very hard to get people to move beyond that. People who may not have the emotional intelligence to do it. I, yeah, I think it's really hard to get them to move beyond that. If you can get them to that, I think that's a big win for a lot of people. And then- Yeah, I, the, I think so too. Decide, you know what? I've spent enough energy on this. Um, I can make choices about how I want to have this person in my life moving forward. I can set boundaries. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not healthy for me to sit and continue brooding over this. Just move on. Yeah, I, th I I can think of a couple of inst like uh, like instances where where in a con in a in like a mediation setting where someone said where they they just needed to hear the other person acknowledge that it caused them harm. They didn't need necessarily the other person to say like I intended to cause you harm. Like even if this person say I didn't intend to cause you harm, that's not what I was doing here. I did it because of this reason, whatever. But I acknowledge that it caused you harm. That acknowledgement is a very big thing that can move people go, finally, I'm being, like, they can see that I was harmed by this, you know? Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting, the um, kind of, th this reminds me a lot of um, apology, and um, that there's a, I, I took a class last semester on apology, forgiveness, and reconciliation, and um, the guy who writes the book for, for this, who's our professor, is um, he defines four different types of apologies based on two different scales items where um, like an X and Y axis, where, you know, you can acknowledge to a degree um, how their behavior how, or how one's behavior uh, injured another. And you can believe to a degree how much you feel like your hurtful behavior was wrong. Um, and so when you have, you know, when somebody believes that they're or acknowledges that their behavior wow. is injured one another and they believe their, their behavior is wrong, that's a remorse apology. And it's typically, you know, typically the most genuine uh, because you're fully admitting for, you know, you, you fully take responsibility. Um, but then there's other, you know, not every apology fits every circumstance. Like a remorse apology won't fit every single circumstance, um, especially if, you know, you're not being honest with yourself about um, you, you actually believing it's, it, it's wrong or you actually understanding that it hurts someone else. So like if you have uh, if someone acknowledges that they've that their behavior has injured someone, but they don't believe their hurtful behavior is wrong, it's a regret apology. You know, you're you're regretful of it. You acknowledge that it hurt someone, but you know I don't really believe that you know that what I did was actually wrong. It's just you know I see that it hurts you, which I feel like is similar to what we're talking about here. That's then that's the one we're talking about. That's the that's the one that's most likely in most cases. Pe people do not want to admit that they were wrong, and they really don't believe they were wrong but they can acknowledge that it did harm someone. Yep, exactly, and yeah. What they really regret is that they got that, that what, that, that what? Thought, or that you're calling them to the table for it. That's what a yeah. lot of times I think that's what they regret, like doggone it. Sometimes, <laughs> I mean, but sometimes people do really regret the fact that it caused harm. I mean, they really, they really don't like the idea that it caused someone harm, but they still believe that what they did they did with right intentions, you know, which, which is sometimes the case, you know. But yeah, but but the the acknowledgement, I like that interest. That's an interesting. Is there like a little article on that that, I, that we could look at? Yeah, I can I can send you some. Uh, I, it's it's a book, but I can uh, send you I can send you a picture of this graph that he has here, and um, yeah, I'd I'd be happy right. to share it. Cool. 
we got like 10 minutes left for the, the last <laughs> no we'll, we'll move on to oh wait, sorry was it done like stateside in the united states or was it ah uh, that's a great question um i don't remember where they where they took i mean the the studies were from you know it's 20 29 different studies so i my guess is they could be from all over um by all over the world but just published in english term in english language journals exactly yeah so then the industries would be broad as well so it'd be like across industries and things like that that would be that'd be an interesting uh uh variable to like look at to to, to see if there were different I, it doesn't seem like there's enough data to like look at the different industry but that'd be an interesting variable yeah that, that's what I'm curious about industry and then like if it were just businesses companies in the united states like regionally if there were differences um because oh, it's yeah. busy, but i mean like i imagine like if like for example if they were doing it you know north south east and west of the united states like the southeastern part of the u.s that has been largely you know an agriculturally and mechanically based industries um, versus maybe Northwest where you've got a lot more tech and that kind of thing. I just, I, I don't know. That would think, I think be really interesting and curious to see yeah. the difference. Yeah. It would be and di different social cultures in those places usually too. Yep. Right, yeah. which they mentioned here too, the culture and all of that will likely influence the, uh, how, how emotional, how emotions are managed and uh, how, yeah. how conflict is managed too. And ur urban settings versus rural settings and stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then the prevalence of just even using conflict management. I mean, yeah. That's different too.